Welcome everybody to ET's seminar series. We're here in Huntsman Hall and on AggieCast to present our student, ath student athlete academic services panel that we have today. And it's gonna be a presentation where our student, or SAS, is that how you pronounce it? SAS, is gonna to talk to us about how we support student athletes here at Utah State and what we can do as instructors to continue pushing that forward, right? So a lot of us have students who are athletes in our courses. How do we handle those situations? What can we do to make their learning experience a benefit at Utah State, make them want to come here, right? So I'm gonna pass this off to Justice Smith right now to get this started. All right, thank you, Shelly. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? Uh, oh, like, we got some whistles up in here. All right, I'll take it. Uh, so my name is Justice Smith. I am the Associate Athletic Director for Academic Services. Um, I'm accompanied here today with my staff from our Student Athlete Academic Services Department, or SAS for short. Um, I think I can speak for all of us to say that we're excited to present to you today um, via the Empowering Teaching Excellence Program. Um, I think this is a great platform for departments to kind of talk things through and figure things out and how the inner workings are. And it gives us a, a better appreciation of the hard work that we all do for the common success for our students on campus. Um, our goal today is going to be this. We're going to try to provide you some insight of our mechanisms and our services we provide to our 350 plus student athletes that we have in the athletics department. Um, we also want to provide you an opportunity to ask questions um, towards the end of our presentation. There will be certain segments that we have in our presentation, so we do want to allot you that time. Um, before I begin, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank a few people. One is Cree Taylor. Cree Taylor came to us to present this idea to us, to present to you. So we want to thank Cree for doing that and it got us to learn a little bit more about the ETE program. And we also want to thank Shelly and Dr. Uh, Travis Thurston as well for getting us all together today. Um, so thank you very much. All right, so where's our home? This is our home. We're in the Jim and Carol Lobb Athletics Academics Complex. We don't say that all the time, we just call it the Lobb. We're, so basically, we're adjacent to the Maverick Stadium in the north end zone. Um, we are on the third floor. Uh, so on the third floor, we share space with our athletics compliance department. Their job is to make sure that our athletics department complies with NCAA, Mountain West Conference, USU campus rules and regulations in our everyday operations. Um, we also share space with our men's and women's cross country and track and field uh, coaches' offices. Um, when you come up to our floor, there's a nice open area. We call that, that our study area. So basically, student athletes can come up there and they can do their academic responsibilities. There's natural light that comes in. You have a nice view of Maverick Stadium. So they'll come up there. If they have structured study time, they'll come and do their work there as well. We have a couple conference rooms up there. One is usually for our weekly conferences. The other is an opportunity for academic advisors to come up to our department and work with our student athletes in regards to getting courses for the upcoming semester or if they have questions about their majors. As you guys would probably figured out, a lot of the athletic responsibilities they have kind of circle around our uh, facility with practices, training table, working out. So if we can bring campus to us to have them handle some responsibilities, it's a great accommodation for them. Um, we also have five tutor rooms. So sometimes student athletes can request a tutor. Um, they'll go ahead and with their tutor and they'll go into a secluded room and they'll go ahead and handle any content of a class they may have um, some questions on or whatnot. We do have a computer lab up there. We have about 20 plus uh, workstations that student athletes can use uh, free of charge. If they need to print anything off as well, they can also do that for free. We have a laptop rental program. So if a student athlete comes up and they say, Justice, my laptop is down, can I borrow one? Absolutely. We give them like a 24 to 48 hour time frame to return that back to us. But once again, they can use the laptop, they can use the computer lab, but mostly they have their own laptops as well. This is our staff, okay? Probably the worst looking one is up on top. So outside of my role, I'm also an academic coordinator and I oversee our uh, men's golf, our women's basketball, and our women's volleyball programs. Jeremiah Siever, he's our assistant director. He oversees our men's basketball, gymnastics, softball, and women's tennis programs. Wanga Damuni, 
He is our assistant athletic director. He's also our director of student athlete development, which we call A-game. And he'll go into that a little bit further as we get into the presentation. But he's our lead academic coordinator for football. He's accompanied by Slade Richardson, who also helps out with football, and he oversees women's soccer. And then we have Kayla Stevens. She's our academic coordinator for men's and women's cross country and track and field, and also oversees men's tennis. We have our learning specialist, Katie Pietzold. She's our tutor and mentor and coordinator. And to round it off, we have Cindy Falstaff, who's our assistant tutor and mentor coordinator as well. And that's our SAS staff. So communication in our department is essential, okay? Whether it's communicating about academics or if there's announcements or events coming up, we use two pieces of software here that some of you folks are probably familiar with. One is our Grades First software. Grades First allows us to set up tutor appointments with our student athletes. Um, they'll get academic appointment notifications through email, let them know, hey, listen, you're either gonna meet with a mentor or a tutor that gets sent to them via email, gives them a heads up about their appointments. Um, student athletes have to do study hall at times, so they're able to log their hours via the Grades First system, and they can keep track of their hours that way. And also any academic appointments, and they can also view their class schedule on there as well. As it relates to uh, communication through development or community service, um, we use Teamworks. Um, Wanga sends out a lot of messages for the A-game development program. That's how we can reach out to our student athletes. Um, any community services I mentioned, any announcements from there. And also coaches use Teamworks as well to send out communication to them as well. So those are our two major software we use. We do have a social media platform. We do use Instagram. Uh, this is our page, Utah State SAS. Um, we use this to provide um, announcements for academic accolades or academic uh, events or announcements. Um, our staff, we select a student athlete of the month, male and female, and also a highest achieving male and female uh, academic award each, each month. So we provide candidates from our teams, we talk about it, we vote, we select those winners, and then we go ahead and put them on our social media page. If there's any campus announcements or events coming up, we'll also post it on this as well. And any sport updates as well. Teams that win championships, if we have a student athlete that earned a student athlete of the week award, we'll post that there as well. So feel free to follow us, by the way. So this graphic, this graphic depicts our success in the spring 2022 semester. We're very proud of our academic accomplishments of our student athletes. Um, we have a report it's called a quantitative, quantitative report. And what this support report allows us to do is see how our teams did academically through their term and CUM GPAs. It has a breakdown in ranges of all of our student athletes and their teams. The 3.37, that statistic right there is a combination of our men's and women's student athletes earning a 3.37 CUME GPA. This is the second highest CUME GPA they've earned in athletics history. Their previous high was a 3.38, and that was back in spring 20. So outstanding work from our men and women student athletes. That 3.55, we're proud to say that's our women holding that CUME GPA. They usually carry the heavy load in our athletics department, so we're proud of what they do. But this is their highest CUME GPA in athletics history. So on and going, outstanding work from our women student athletes. 72% of our student athletes uh, have earned a 3.0 or higher CUM GPA. 40 represents the amount of times we've had a 3.0 or higher CUM GPA in consecutive semesters since 2002. So the end of fall, we're looking to hit that number 41 mark and keep it going from there. 49 of our student athletes earned Dean's Honors List. So once again, as you folks already know, a 3.5 or higher CUME GPA with about 15 or more credit hours that can help you earn your Dean's List uh, honors. And that 241, that 241 represents our Whitesides Scholar Athlete Award winners. As a student athlete in the athletics department, all of our student athletes look to attain the Whitesides Scholar Athlete honor. In order to do so, our student athletes have to earn a 3.2 or higher CUME GPA. And what's great about this, we have an outstanding celebration for them in the spring semester. We have a luncheon. President Cockett comes in. We have our provosts come in. Uh, the deans of our colleges come in. 
just having a great celebration in their accomplish accomplishments for earning this, this accolade. Some other numbers here real briefly. We had 180 academic all Mountain West Conference award winners last year. Uh, basically to attain this, student athlete has to get a 3.0 or higher CUME GPA and also have participated in about 50% of their competitive sport. We had 191 Mountain West Scholar Athlete Award winners, which put us at number one in the Mountain West Conference. In order to get this, our student athletes need to have a 3.5 CUME GPA for that academic year. We had a 90% graduation success rate. Um, our graduation success rate is basically a comparison of the student athletes that enter college and athletic aid in comparison to those that graduate within a six year time frame. Utah State has led the Mountain West over the last several years when it comes to GSR, and we are still one of those top institutions with this percentage. 985 multi-year APR, so what's all this acronym stuff? Well, APR stands for Academic Progress Rate. Basically what that does, it gives you a real-time view of the academic culture with our teams. How are our teams doing? Are we retaining them? Are they hitting eligibility? Those numbers we utilize to get our numbers here 985 is our number for this year. In previous years, last several years, we had a 979 and a 980. So it can, you can see the progress we're making. And this also is an testament to our coaches and the type of student athletes they recruit here at Utah State. So great work on their part. Last but not least, 62 graduates in the 21-22 academic year. As you can see, usually our spring term tends to be our higher number of graduates uh, that we have each and every year. This slide um, basically talks about our vision. Um, it it's a definition of our department, but simply stated, um, if you were to remove all the accolades that we have, um, our job is basically to support our student athletes to acquire a graduate degree and to prepare them for life after sports. That's the bottom line. That's why we come here every single day. This is what we're passionate about, and this is what we do each and every day. We're proud of what we do. This slide right here depicts the role of the academic coordinator. So what do we do on a daily basis? What do we do throughout the academic year? First thing, we develop an academic plan for success. Now what does that look like? As an academic coordinator, we want to get an idea of our student athletes before they even step foot on campus. So how do we do that? We take a look at their transcripts, we take a look at their standardized test scores, we talk to the recruiting coaches to see how they are as an individual. We provide a questionnaire that is sent to them as well. Um, this questionnaire provides us basically factors that let us know whether or not the student athlete will have difficulty graduating. Um, we take all those tools and we create an academic success plan. This plan can include one, a mentor. A mentor is a student athlete, or excuse me, as an individual that works with our student athletes that helps them with academic skills. Um, note taking, test taking, time management, to create a syllabus calendar for them. A syllabus calendar is basically a spreadsheet that provides all the assignments a student has in all of their courses and it's used for the mentor, for the academic court, and the student athletes so they can see what they have upcoming for that semester. Um, also, structured study time is also essential too. So whether you're a transfer or you're an incoming freshman, you will be assigned a mentor. Why? Because we want a smooth transition. We want structure for you. We want you to be successful. We want to see how you do with our resources, and eventually we'd like to see you become an independent learner. Transfers that come in, we have them with a mentor the first semester. At the end of that semester, we'll do an evaluation on them and determine if, they're, if they still need a mentor or if they can do away with the mentor. The idea is, once again, have them become independent learners. Freshmen, they will have a mentor all academic year. So even if they're doing good their first semester, we still want them to finish off with that mentor. Why? Because structure is important for an incoming freshman for transition. And if everything looks good at the end of that spring and we feel you're confident and accountable, we'll set you free. Um, tutors. Tutors are part of the process, too. Once again, as I mentioned, um, students can request a tutor for any course content that they have, um, and that will be essential. So between a mentor, a tutor, and structured study time, that's our plan for success for our student athletes. 
We assist with major selection. So obviously we talk to our student athletes, what their passions are, what majors they want to be involved in, um, their communication with campus advisors, so on and so forth. That would be valuable. And also with the career service department, career services department, having a career coach as well to figure out what profession do I want to be in uh, when the time is up. We collaborate with campus advisors for course scheduling. Um, we tell our student athletes to make sure you have all the information needed when you talk to your advisor. Uh, we provide them a registration form that allows the advisor to put all the courses that they need for their upcoming semester. And why is that important? Well, what it does for us, it allows us to make sure all those courses are applicable towards their major. We want our student athletes to graduate in a timely fashion. So if they're able to get their undergrad within their eligibility year and they still have more time, if they can get a master's under us as well, let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's see. Over NCAA eligibility requirements, obviously we keep track of their eligibility, making sure they're handling their eligibility criteria, and once again, making sure all their courses are applicable for their, for their major. Uh, we serve as a liaison with faculty and major advisors. Um, we tell our student athletes this. We want you to be accountable. We want you to be proactive. You initiate conversation with your faculty, with your instructors, with your academic advisors. We want you to start this conversation. Where do we come into play is when maybe the conversation is a little convoluted and we need to kind of help, help you kind of articulate that message you're trying to get through. That's where we come in. Um, sometimes when we try to figure some scenarios out, maybe there's just kind of a hurdle in the way, we usually ask our faculty athletics rep, who is Ed Heath. Ed is basically, he reports to faculty and administration on campus, but he's the voice of our student athletes when it comes to their academic well-being. So we do have a point person for that if we need to discuss further on certain situations. Uh, we develop programs for students with special learning, and need, special learning needs. This is where Katie um, is our point person for a number of these items here. If a student athlete has an IEP or a 504 plan, um, Katie will have them go through the process and work with the DRC department. Um, and as well, if there's any mental, uh, mental health or mental wellness, uh, things we need to take care of, we'll work with CAPS, and that will be through Katie and her services. And last but not least, you know, we develop a graduation plan, right? We want them to stay on track for their projected graduation semester. Um, we'll provide those resources for them to do so, and there's three things that we want out of them when it comes to graduation. They're either doing three things. One is they are graduating and getting to the profession that they want to be in, hopefully. Two, we're getting them ready for grad school. And the last piece, if they're fortunate enough, to get to the next level and be compensated for the sports that they're doing, that's a dream come true for them, obviously. But those three items are the last, those are the three things that we look for when it comes to a development of graduation plan. So all of these items here are kind of the gist of what we do. We do have other tools and processes. Some of those tools, once again, uh, some of you might be familiar with, for example, if we have student athletes that need to travel, um, we go ahead and provide a travel letter for them. We encourage our student athletes to provide instructors a schedule of the year at the beginning of the semester so we kind of have an idea of what courses they may miss. And also we provide a travel letter about a week prior to to help remind our instructors, hey, listen, there's a, there's a day that our student athletes are going to miss and can we find a way for them to either make up the work, a schedule, another lab, uh, a makeup lab, so on and so forth. But once again, we put that on the student athlete. They have to be proactive in what they do. Okay, that's all that I got. I'm gonna have Katie come up and talk to you a little bit more about our learning specialist position. All right. All right, so thank you everyone for being here. I'm Katie, our learning specialist. So most of our academic coordinators, they all work with individual sports. I actually work with all the sports. Um, so. With that, I collaborate with our campus resources, as Justice was saying, so with our DRC and with CAPS. And in that, we also have a bi-weekly meeting with our student athlete wellness team. So Amy, who's there in the corner, is a part of that, as well as some other upper admin and representatives from CAPS and Sorensen, who we also partner with. And then we also have a representative from sports medicine. So we try to you know, make sure that we're hitting all the different areas for our students. 
and then I meet with a caseload of students regularly. So every day I've got students in my office. They're assigned either one to three times a week to work with me for anywhere from 60 minutes to two hours a day. It just kind of varies on the student and their needs. And then I also oversee our tutor mentor program. So that means hiring, training, recruiting, any kind of tutor or mentor that we may need. This semester I started coming to campus more and reaching out to different professors. So that's been helpful as well and just making announcements and classes for any tutors we may need. And then I also during the summer teach a section of USU 1730. So that's the strategies for academic success course. So a lot of our incoming student athletes need to take a course during the summer. Um, so that's one that we teach in the Spetman, which is in our auditorium of the lob complex, just so that way we can again accommodate with their practice schedules in the summer. So my caseload, um, each semester it does vary. Typically I have about 14 students and it's usually made up of football, a few men's basketball, and then occasionally some Olympic sports in there. Again, it just varies each semester. And with that, again, I'm continuing to reach out to DRC, whether it's they just need temporary accommodations or they've had paperwork in the past and so we're just getting them registered, encouraging them to reach out to you guys for help in the classroom, talk to their TAs, and then assisting them in any other counseling sessions and making sure that they're getting all that paperwork in and also checking email. Um, I also meet with students, so like I said, one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes they do overlap and we'll have some group sessions. It just again, depends on the student and their learning type. Some really like to be individualized and if they've got ADHD, we have to, you know, turn off all the other distractions and then other kids really thrive off of that group environment. With that, as Justice mentioned, we do a syllabus calendar, or I like to call it a semester calendar. So we go through the syllabus or we have access to Academic Observer and I go through and every single day of the semester if there's an assignment due, we color code it, we cross things out as it's done. If it's missing, we highlight it. Just a good way to help them become self-regulated and time management skills. We check emails, assignment submissions. So a lot of times kids like to say they've turned something in. And before we reach out to you guys and say, why isn't it graded? We like to check their email because maybe you have emailed them and there's a reason it's not graded or they actually didn't submit it. Um, so there's a lot of just checking on their end with that. And then, as we mentioned, we communicate a lot via grades first and teamworks. And then with those individual students, I'll also communicate with email and text message. So identifying at risk when students are coming in, we have what's called a student athlete personal history form. On that form, there's a lot of questions about have they previously had accommodations? Do you struggle with certain courses? How many high schools did you go to? Did other people in your family graduate from college? So it kind of gives us a broad overview of that individual. And from there, there's a ranking system. So it's a little small up here, but we base off of what their SAT or ACT score is. And if it's below a certain threshold, they're assigned two points. If they identify, oh, I think there's a pointer. If they identify strongly as an athlete and not a student, then they're assigned a point. So on and so forth with academic effort lacking, that's based off the different questions. There's a scale that they can adjust on how they feel. If they're a transfer student, um, they're assigned four points. If they're first gen or if they have a history of being homesick, they're assigned a point. If they've got a health issue and they've experienced multiple injuries, concussion, mental health, um, anything in that category, they're assigned a point. And then if they're a high profile student athlete, so it's a five star recruit, it's a big deal they're coming here, they're gonna be assigned a point. Or if they're team culture, some, some sports are a little more willing to go into academics than others. So depending on that, they may be assigned a point. So taking all of these points, depending on what the student scores, we add that up. If they score three to four points or lower, they're assigned green, which means they're low risk. If they're assigned five to six points, we consider them moderate risk. And if they're assigned seven or more total points, they're considered high risk or red. Typically, I meet with the high risk students. 
And with that, once this scoring system is in place, I sit with each of the academic coordinators and their caseload of students, and we go through and discuss, OK, well, this student scored as high risk seven points, but why was that? And if it's because they're a transfer student, well, that's four points, and maybe everywhere else across the board, they're doing everything they need. So we kind of look at that, and they're not, they may then get bumped down to a moderate or low risk based off of that. So as Justice mentioned, we do have tutoring services. Currently, we have about 370 uh, appointments scheduled, or student athletes in appointments. So we have 14 tutors on staff currently. We're always hiring. We've got a few more in the works. 48 tutor appointments. Again, that fluctuates, but that's about our averages. All of our tutoring this semester has been moved to in-person. During COVID and last spring, we were flexing a little bit and doing virtual, but we feel like they get the most out of it when they're in person and they show up more. Um, so a lot of the tutoring is by request. Sometimes if we just know right off the bat that a student's gonna struggle in a subject, we'll assign them to tutoring as well. And we did come up with a missed appointment policy. So if our students don't show up at all, they get marked as a no-show. After a third no-show, there's a fee associated with that. So again, we're just trying to hold our students accountable. And if they're 15 minutes late, that's also considered a no-show. That one's a little bit more up to the discretion of the tutor or the mentor. Um, but again, just trying to integrate that time management skills with them. So any other cancellations will have to be approved by the academic coordinator. So again, if they're traveling or if there's a class conflict for some reason, we always try to make that accommodation. And then mentoring, all those same rules apply. This one, um, we do have some students request mentoring, but typically it's just automatically assigned, as Justice was mentioning those qualifications if they're a freshman or a transfer student. We currently have nine mentors on staff, and then Cindy is our assistant tutor and mentor coordinator. She also has a caseload of students that she meets with. And so we have about 80 mentor appointments scheduled this semester. Um, and those can range anywhere, again, from one to twice a week for about an hour time slot. In those sessions, as much as they are doing assignments, we're also going over time management, going through that semester calendar, looking at their communication with their professors, with uh, classmates if they need help, and then going over test taking, note taking skills, textbook reading, writing, we have different, we use a lot of what the campus resources that are offered and refer them over to there. Or I know like here in Huntsman, there's a lot of drop-in accounting appointments. And we try to get the kids to go to those as well. And then, like I said, assigned and by request for mentoring. All righty, I'm gonna pass it off to Jeremiah here. So as Cindy did mention, we brought the flyers with yeah, us. That would be helpful for Terry. Please send them our way. Yes, can. absolutely. For tutors, if they're undergrad, we pay $12. If they're a graduate student, we pay $13. And then if they are a mentor, that scale starts at 13 as undergrad and goes to 14 as a graduate student. So mentors do make a dollar more an hour. And then we also have study hall monitors, as Jeremiah works with them currently, and that is $11 an hour, because they don't work one-on-one -on -one with students. They just kind of sit in the evenings and look over the study hall area and make sure everyone's staying on task. My name is Jeremiah Sievers. I'm the Assistant Director of Academics. We'll be talking about international students, as I am the liaison to the Global Engagement Department. So currently, on all of our rosters, we have 32 international students across 20 different countries. So 13 of our 16 varsity sports have at least one international student. Um, kind of some of the places that our students have come from, both past and present, as you can see, Bahrain, Suriname, Ireland, Japan, Colombia, Morocco, Slovakia, Ukraine, Turkey. So we get students from all over the place, and that is an up-to-date map, so that kind of gives you an idea as to at this very moment where all of our student athletes are from. So student athletes have a few requirements that normal students do not. Um, 
The NCAA requires all students, whether they are international or domestic, to become certified um, academically going into their freshman year. For internationals, we have a fun 500-page guide that goes through every single country and what every single country's requirements are. So a big part of my job is evaluating those transcripts from all over these countries. Um, every, every country is different. Some have three years of high school, some four, some two. So it's always a fun little puzzle, no matter which one. And then we determine if those student athletes will meet their core courses. They also will upload English translations of all of their transcripts if they are from a country where the native language is not English. Um, also, if they're from Quebec, that is another big one. So for athletics and global engagement, I work directly with their admissions individuals. So Nancy Hyden, Connie, Radke, Kurian. They probably hear from me every single day, whether they like it or not. Um, students upload transcripts, proof of English proficiency. So they'll take a test such as the TOEFL or if they took the ACT or SAT, depending on how they did in those. Um, they also upload passport an affidavit of financial support showing that they have the money capable to come to the US, so about forty dollars to $50,000. Um, bank statements showing that amount. And then once they're admitted, I work with Christopher Cameron to deal with their visa and I-20 issues. And then once they get here, they check in upon arrival showing the US that they are actually in the country. And then once they're here, we just do continued support, such as when COVID was happening, that was a big time for us trying to figure out if we could get students even into the US or if they could even go home, um, NIL, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then any visa renewals is kind of a big game as well, because some countries you know, don't allow renewals at certain times, or they may have a country that they were friendly with, who they used to do renewals with that they don't anymore. So lots of fun with that. So registration, internationals also have fun requirements that are in regards to their visa. Um, undergraduate students have to be in at least 12 hours, so full time. And of those 12, nine of them must be face-to-face -face credits. So they cannot be you know, a student who's taking three online and one in person. They are required to basically show the US that they are here, they are committed to taking classes here. Same with graduate students, nine credits full time, six of those must be face-to-face. Once they hit that nine though, then everything after that, if they want, could be online, but they need at least those six for graduates, nine for undergrad. How that affects us, unfortunately, there are some majors where they're off limits to our international students. We try not to tell student athletes that there are certain majors they can't do, but with internationals, just due to some majors basically being fully online or having more of an online component than others, we can't put them in those. The other thing is practice and competition scheduling. You can't have a student athlete who is an international taking all online during their competition season. So I can't have a softball player, you know, who's international be all online because they're gonna be traveling for the first seven weeks. So that is kind of something that we deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I know name image likeness is a big thing that's come around with athletics recently. So if you don't know, that is now student athletes are allowed to make money off of their name, their image, and their likeness. What that kind of deals with student athletes that are international, um, we deal with on campus versus off campus work. So international student athletes are allowed to work on campus, but they are not allowed to work off campus unless it is something such as occupational training, something that deals with their major. A lot of of the NIL sphere is considered off-campus work. So a lot of student athletes basically that are international cannot do any NIL deals. Um, the federal government has not had a response to this. They've kind of just let it stay up in the air. So a lot of students at different universities are being told a lot of different things. Some schools are telling their student athletes, once you get to your home country, you can do it. Some are saying, as long as it's a company from your home country, you can do it while you're, at, while you're here. Some are saying, you know, as long as the money stays at home, you're fine. Um, our go-to is talk to an immigration attorney. So at the end of the day, we're not lawyers. We don't have, you know, that knowledge. So we always will suggest that they go to an immigration attorney who can kind of help them through that process, give them ideas. 
Um, we've had some students who have been able to do some NIL deals because of that, but that is always kind of our go-to. So our role with that is just education of the general visa rules. Like I said, we kind of try and tell them the difference between off-campus versus on-campus work. Um, and then we also, once again, direct them towards immigration. I'm gonna hand it off to Wonga Damuni now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Awesome. How's everybody doing? My name is Wanga Damuni. Um, I am the assistant AD for student athlete development um, and an academic coordinator for football. And I kind of, I, I feel fortunate in that, although I work exclusively with, uh, primarily with the student athletes for football from an academic standpoint, I get to work with all the student athletes when it comes to student athlete development. And that's something that I'm passionate about and I, I love doing because I love to help our student athletes succeed off the court, off the field of play and outside of the classroom so that we can prepare them like just as mentioned, prepare them for life after sports. Okay, so I just wanted to, before I begin, I wanted to start a, play a video real quick of what um, we do from a, st a student athlete development standpoint. As they were a year ago But I'll be okay I move on each and every day The past is where it stays Way back a year ago I've changed for the better this time I thought I would never be fine I strive just to say I'm alright So the student athlete development program, what is that? I'm just going to touch on that um, from the NCAA standpoint. Um, what we do on campus um, as far as our A-game development program is what we call it. But I also oversee the SAC, which is the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, and as well as the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council within our athletic department. So I'll touch on that as well. But what is the uh, student athlete development program? The NCAA... Uh, mandated that every um, institution across the, the nation um, implement a student athlete development program to enhance the, the overall experience of our student athletes within the context of higher education. And um, it started in 1991 with the Champs Life Skills and it, it evolved over time to what is known as our student athlete development program. Here at Utah State, um, we named our student athlete development program the A-Game. And uh, I'm going to explain that in a little bit, but our A-game is a comprehensive commitment by our athletic department um, to foster in the, the total development and growth of our student athletes. We want them to be successful, um, not only here on campus, but like, like we mentioned, uh, with life after sports. When they're done here, 
exhausted area, really we want them to be successful uh, parents, uh, professionals, uh, and, and whatnot. So that is basically what, what student athlete development is. Anything to do with um, activities outside of the classroom and out, outside of their respective sports. The definition of A-game, now I, I present this to our student athletes in our freshman orientation, and when I tell them that, what, what's, what's your definition of A-game? Everybody, every student athlete knows what that is. They can relate to that because they're, they're competitive by nature, and they know that it's very important that they have their A-game with them in their respective sports. So we try to um, help them develop that same attitude when they enter the classroom or when in life as well. Take that competitive mindset and, and go compete wherever you are. And when you bring your A game, the chances of uh, success is very high. So definition of A game, one's highest level of play or performance. Now I share this, let me see, where is it? Yeah, I share this, this, um, this is one of my favorite quotes that I use um, by James A. Mishner when, when I talk with our student athletes. And it, it, it's the master of the art of living, right? So it's the master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his information and his recreation, his love and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence in all that he does, leaving others to decide whether he's working or playing. But to him, he's doing both. And that's what we try. That's the message I want to present to our student athletes when they, when they go to class, when they're playing in their respective sports, or where they're, they're outside in the community providing service. If they can give if they can pursue their vision of excellence in all that they do, they'll be successful, okay? And that is pretty much what we um, use as a, our A-game model, is pursuing a vision of excellence. Now, our A-game program is a cohort-based program, and we broke it up um, as such for, for, um, to help our student-athletes in, in the different cohorts. So, for example, our freshmen, oh, excuse me, Freshmen, the freshmen, uh, and, and we've named each cohort, um, uh, we have a theme for each cohort, okay? So the freshman um, cohort is transition and engagement. So we want our freshmen to have that smooth transition, um, whether it's from high school or if they're off a mission, to have that smooth transition into Utah State. In the fall, that uh, A-game program is um, within, it's built within, it, with, uh, into our connections class, the USU 1010 connections class. This is a student athlete class uh, in, uh, enrollment. And so they meet every Monday night at 7 p.m. and they, they go ev over every topic that is um, required here on campus. But we also, we, we um, present it with a student athlete kind of emphasis, right? And that's held every Monday night. That's their programming in the fall. In the spring, we'll have a mind and body bridging program uh, working with uh, mental health, and we work closely with the I Institute on campus, Dr. Uh, Derek Tolson and Kevin Webb, and they present workshops to our freshman student athletes, um, three workshops in the spring to help them with the uh, mind and body bridging. And these, these student athletes learn this technique. I mean, it's a game changer because they take this and they can be successful in sports and life and just life in general if, if they are able to utilize these um, these techniques that they learn from the mind and body bridging. As far as the sophomore, by the time they get a year under their belt, we want to focus more on the, the leadership and involvement with them. So in the fall, we'll um, invite a speaker over to, to present to our sophomores and talk about leadership, um, leadership strategies, leadership advice that they can give them. This past fall, we had a, a former student athlete, um, he came, he's a chief, he was a city, city commissioner from the San Francisco Police Department, former student athlete who came in and presented to the, to the student athletes, DJ Brookster, very successful businessman in the San Francisco Bay Area. And in the spring, we'll have, a, we'll have them organize a, a big community service project and, and gi they give them uh, ways to give back to the community, okay? Our junior um, theme is the career readiness. By this, by this time in their careers here at Utah State, Student athletes can pretty much tell if they're, they have a shot at the leagues professionally or, or they gotta, gotta start thinking about life after sports. So we start working with them on, in fall 
in the fall we'll work on a re resume workshop and we had one this uh, past month. Uh, Elise Newberry from a career coach from here in the Huntsman uh, came over and set up shop at our uh, at the lob and was able to meet with about 10 to 12 student athletes to either upgrade their resumes or, or start one. So that was that was a success. And then in the spring we'll have our mock interviews at the stadium. We'll invite 50 to 60 businesses around the valley and here on campus to come and um, meet with our student athletes, our junior cohort, and just do speed interviews to help them practice and, and get ready for um, any, any interviews that they'll have. And then the, our senior um, cohort, we named this the progression uh, phase. And this, this progression, uh, we've all heard the, um, we're familiar with that NCAA commercial, right? You, you can go pro in other, anything other than sports sometimes. Well, we, we, we took that and we, um, we made that this theme as well because we want to uh, make sure we prepare our student athletes if they want to go you know, if they go to pro, uh, professionally play sports, that's awesome. That's icing on the cake. But we want to prepare them either to go, if they want to go to grad school, we'll, we'll, we'll help them and with recommendations letters and whatnot. Or if they want to con continue on in the, in the professional um, workforce, then we can help them as well. But we'll have, for them, we'll, we'll provide a etiquette, a dress and etiquette dinner um, here at the Sky Room. We'll have one next Wednesday. Um, we have about 18 seniors that are graduating in the fall. We'll provide them. Um, with a, a workshop where they'll learn how to have the proper dinner etiquette and, and can sit with businesses from around the valley that we'll invite and just kind of interact and, and whatnot. So that'll be, that, that's the, the programming that we have for our student athletes here at Utah State, okay? Now, in addition to that cohort base within the A game, our signature events that we, we like to have every year uh, is the Little Lambs. We work closely with the Little Lambs to, to help, uh, you know, we, we'll, they'll, they'll have a party, a Christmas party, so we'll go in and, and have our student athletes interact with the, the kids from the different, uh, the different foster homes and uh, people who come to this, the Little Lambs presentation. And then we also do the Festival of Trees here on campus. And we, we um, the athletic department will pay for the trees and then each team will be responsible to, to decorate the trees and those, those trees are then uh, given to the, the needy families around the valley. And then in addition to that, um, we also have our homecoming and pioneer day parades that we, we don't require, we, we highly encourage our student athletes to be a part of, especially the, the freshmen. So that, that way they can learn how to give back to the community and um, show their appreciation for the fans that come out and support them. And these are some of the, the different student athletes who, who went pro, right? On the top, we see some of these um, familiar names. Sam Merrill, Ashley Cardozo, Justin Bean, Nimi, and Jordan Love were highly successful in their sport and was able, had the opportunity to advance to the next level professionally in, the, in their sports. And they're doing awesome. All graduated. Um, well, still working on this one, right, Jeremiah? And then um, at the bottom, we have uh, some other student, former student athletes. Um, Kennedy Hira, awesome baseball, uh, softball player. She's at Goldman and Satch, senior financial analyst. We have Chase Nelson. He's currently working um, in, in medical school right now, wanting to become a doctor. But he was a, a, one of our NCAA postgraduate scholarship um, recipients. And then we have Dimitri Alifua, who is working down at Silicon the Silicon Slopes, um, and I'll touch on him a little more after this, but um, he's doing well right now in the, in the tech field. And then Riley Plogger, an awesome, another awesome softball player who's a speech and language pathologist. So this is just some of the examples of our seniors in, in the pro phase, right? You either go pro athletically or you can go pro professionally. And, and, and like Justice mentioned, our goal is to make sure that we help them. We provide the resources here on campus to help them um, be successful for life after sports. Okay. Now, Dimitri, I, I just wanted to touch on him. This young man came in early, graduate early from high school, was a three-year starter on the offensive line. Promising NFL career. He left to go train in Minnesota, came back pro day to try out for, you know, in front of the scouts. Had a great pro day, and when, when the draft came around, he didn't, make, he didn't get the call. 
didn't get the call, and, um, he, but he has a family. He has a wife and kid. He calls me, telling me he needed a job. Okay. Well, I, I kind of, after getting on his case for not taking advantage of our program and whatnot, you know, we, we had a crash course in, in resume workshop, and, and I, we helped put a resume together. I made a call down to Silicon Slopes, where he currently works, and asked, asked them if they would be willing to meet with him. Long story short, he got the job. But before, he had, before the interview, he calls me, go, okay, I got an interview set up. I go, cool, good luck, go kill it. He said, but I don't, know, I don't have a resume. I need, I need a resume. So again, as I mentioned, we helped him get a resume together. And then I told him when he got the job, right when he called and told, told me he got the job, I told him he needed to write, uh, write a testimonial of, of how effective we can be in the A-game program to help them with life after sport. And that's what he, this is what he wrote. And I shared this with our incoming freshmen to let them know that, you know, we're here to provide you guys with the resources. We want to prepare you guys for life after sports because their careers are going to come to an end athletically. And we wanted to make sure that we have um, the resources and programming to help them be successful. And then just real quick, the other two um, programs that I work closely with, Justice and Amy, is the Athletic Diversity um, Equity and Inclusion Council. Uh, this is our uh, charge and our model, but the different things that we do um, basically is to help our student athletes feel safe, have an environment where they can feel safe and, and they can come to Utah State and, and be productive and, and earn a degree. But we, wanted, we provide them with these resources. We work closely with um, Cree Taylor uh, in, in developing the Juneteenth uh, 5K race every summer. And then we encourage it, like we're, we're going to um, get into gear and uh, encourage our student athletes to get out and vote next week. Um, the NCAA passed uh, um, a, a rule that when, when it's voting time, all activities, athletic activities are canceled. So they'll have an opportunity to get out and ra uh, vote. Uh, we have the 5K race, as I mentioned, and then the different initiatives that we create within our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion Council to help our student athletes, to have them feel safe and, and let them enjoy their experience here at, at Utah State. And that's pretty much it from the athletic uh, student athlete development standpoint. And I'll turn the time over to Eric, uh, excuse me, Justice to wrap it up. Thank you guys for presenting. Do we have any questions? And we need to use this. So if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll run over to you. I wore the right shoes today, trust me. And I'm going to ask my friend here to look at these questions. Okay. Okay. While she's coming here, I'm thinking. No, um, I've just had like really great experiences with you professionally in, in many cases. Uh, I teach at a regional campus and I've talked to you on the phone and via email and just had a, a great experience. I really appreciate what you do for the student athletes. And uh, But you know, it seems to me, I've got a class where I, I can't identify whether they're student athletes or not. It's an online class, it's a leadership class, and I know that they are because they write about it. They have to write essays, it's a writing intensive class. And you know they're either really, really good or really, really not good. Um, and and lately there's been more not good. And um, I I just like to say that I'd this is maybe a statement more than a question. I'd like you to tell the ones that you know the red ones you know in your scale the one they're having. I like you to tell them would you go on the field without a coach having worked with you for a while? Don't send me a paper without having the coach. Look at it. They've got resources from you. They can t call me or send the paper to me anytime ahead of the deadline, and I'll review it and go over it. I won't do pencil editing for them, but I'll. Uh, th th that's maybe her job, but um, I. But I'll do. You know, I'll, I'll. I'll make sure that it's it's in the right direction. Uh, th there's the writing center on campus, which is an excellent resource. Um, I have a teaching assistant who stays up nights and works with them at times. So there's just a lot of people who will coach. Don't go on the field without that coach if you're turning in a paper. Um, and so, you know, with that, I'll just pass it on. I, 
I do have a question. Um, so I get the, I can understand the logistical aspects of bringing as much campus to lob as you need to, as you can. Um, I wonder what kind of things, because it, in my limited experience with student athletes, they're often, because they miss a lot of class, um, I feel like they group together often. And um, I worry in a way that I was never a student athlete, so just imagining um, about their sense of community in a larger sense of their community here at USU, aside from their communities with on their teams. And then it seems like there's really a ton of student athlete community that you're all building. So I wonder what kind of things um, you all work with or if this is a potential place where there could be better or what already exists in terms of helping athletes really connect with other things on campus that are outside of their athletic departments and their teams. So especially as teachers trying to integrate student athletes into the overall USU community? Yes. OK. Helping our right. Uh, so that's one of the things we continuously try to do. So even us being a part of this is our way of trying to reach out to campus and whatnot. Um, we have ways to communicate with student athletes in regards to other opportunities, in regards to them potentially missing class. Um, we, ha we do have some teams that have the opportunity to provide GAs that go out and actually go to class to do class checks. We do some have, have opportunities for that. Um, for us, um, anytime class is missed, we hope it's based on a uh, missed absence because of an NCAA event that's coming up. Um, if, they are, if they have missed otherwise, either due to illness or anything to that extent, Hopefully you can get a response from us or from Sports Medicine indicating they're ill and they cannot attend class. I think that was to answer that question. Um, but in regards to continue to try to get them a part of campus, um, once again, it's reaching out to us, letting us know more. Um, how we can help you out with that. If there's events coming up, if you have extra teaching or tutoring hours on campus, that would be helpful for us. Feel free to reach out to the academic coordinator, and we're always there to communicate that to our student athletes. And sometimes we really tell them, you're going there, rather than a communication. So if you stay in contact with us, we'll be able to help you out as well. Anybody else? And then I would just add to that, so all of our student athletes that either I meet with or mentor or tutor, our mentors, tutors, and myself included, really emphasize our student athletes checking their email, looking at Canvas notifications. So as a professor, I would recommend, I know they don't always look at Canvas or their email, but when they're with us, we make them. So even if you're just making an announcement in class, it's like, hey, I have a TA that stays up really late and would be willing to look over your paper. And just like, I, it's an extra step, but just kind of taking that extra step and that extra mile to engage them, at least we'll see it when we're with them and we can reiterate it to them over and over and we become broken records. But that's another way that we can, again, kind of back up what you're doing. And I know from a, from a student athlete development perspective, we highly encourage our, our student athletes to get involved with clubs on campus, um, we collaborate with the different clubs. Uh, for example, the Black Student Union had a cookout. We bought uh, tickets and, and gave the first 35 guys who, who wants to go. And then we actually had over 60 guys trying to, trying to attend that event. But just the different events, we encourage them to, to attend and, and get to know people on campus. And I, I do not believe in recreating the wheel. So I know we have resources here on campus that I, I work with, the in entrepreneurship, the career services, to, to collaborate and create programs for our student athletes so that they know that there's things that exist here on campus for them as well. I have, um, I'm gonna cut you off, Leanne, sorry. I have a question, and not to put anybody on the spot, but you talked about a little bit of the restrictions when it comes to international students. Um, again, not trying to put anybody on the spot, but there are there departments, uh, departments or colleges that are more difficult for students to be part of because of their schedules or because of <laughs> or because of active participation or cooperation so we first off try to encourage our student athletes to whatever major they want to go with like we're going to attempt to make that work um like 
I don't want to put any majors on the spot, but anything that's going to be, you know, a smaller major where there's one section time for a class, like all the classes, those are typically a lot harder. If it's a heavily intensive math type course or something where the expectation is five years right off the bat, those can be a little tough because a lot of student athletes tend to come in exploratory. Um, they don't really know what they want to do. So by the time we figure out like, oh, I want to do outdoor product design or I want to do engineering or I want to do teaching with the STEP program, it becomes more difficult in that sense. So we do try to encourage our students to do what major they want to. But yes, I would say there are some tougher ones just with the limitations. And if it's a smaller major and, you know, there's one class that's required and this is the only time that it's you know, we have it and it's only in the spring, those can be a little tough or those majors where the expectation is five years for even a typical student. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. This has been incredibly um, helpful to me. I have lots of different kinds of athletes in my classroom. I've got Right now, I think maybe half the tennis men's tennis team is in my data viz class right now, and um, I have um, basketball players and um, track. I have all sorts, and I get the e email that asks about their status, right? Of have their grade at that moment, right? And then I think is that twice a semester I might get that twice a semester. But my question is, do you have access to the Canvas course? Are you reviewing some of their assignments and helping them to, uh, if they've got some late assignments, I try to be accommodating and ex make some ex extensions, especially if they communicate with me beforehand, all that professionalism type expectations. But I'm just wondering if, if that's something that's happening on your end to help um, help them be successful. Yes, great question, by the way. Uh, so we do. We have something called Academic Observer that allows us to have a viewing of their courses and the assignments they've submitted. So what's helpful for that is when we said to uh, student athletes have the ability to request a tutor, sometimes they're reluctant, reluctant to do so. And so if we see a trend or a pattern that's happening with their assessments or their assignments and it's not looking good, will be the ones to provide them a tutor as well. But also, too, it, it strikes a conversation. Looking at their course and see how things are going, we'll bring them in. We'll have their conversation with them. We'll ask them, hey, you didn't do so hot in this assignment. What happened? Oh, Justice, I, I just messed up. It was a bad assignment. OK, let's not do it again. How can I help you? Providing them the tools to do so, now if we see it again, now we know we probably got to place some other mechanisms in there to make them be successful in that process. So to answer your question, yes, we do have the ability to see how they're doing in those courses. And although we do reach out to professors, instructors twice a semester, we want to be able to reach out to you more often. But once again, we always tell the student athlete, we want them to be proactive, to talk to you first, go to your office hours, find out how you can um, do better in the course and how we can come in from the back end and help out in that manner. And I will just kind of add on to that to further answer your question. So when we have Academic Observer, what we can see is the assignment title, how many points it's worth, and if it's been submitted or graded. So beyond, sometimes we can get a syllabus. It's been a little wonky this semester. So in any regards to an assignment and what the directions are or what the requirements are of it, that we do have to have the student come in and like physically show us on their Canvas account, or we have to ask them to somehow copy, download it, and send it to us so that we can see those requirements, because we really can just see the bare bones. Oh, and we need data tutors. <laughs> <laughs> we need yeah. data tutors. Oh. Okay, all right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Good question? Um, so the, this is sort of what Sam was asking about, but um, how wel welcome do the student athletes feel on campus in the classrooms? And what can we as instructors do on a day-to-day -day or on an overall level of engaging them more um, in our classes and, and on campus? And I, I, it's twofold. I really do want to know, like, do they feel part of the classes, part of the majors? 
or is it more that because they're so tied into sports and their teams and everything revolves around their their work schedule, right? Like they work more than most of my students do. And and I tell them that when they come into my classes that I understand that, but I really want to figure out how to, as they're there, engage them to the maximum amount because they have a lot to offer that some of the other students don't. Oh, I got him. <laughs> so I think in terms of how welcome they feel it kind of just depends on the student athlete and how engaged they are um just to kind of answer that first part i've had some where you know all of their classes are in person so they're going they're getting to meet other people in the major and they're really getting to like understand campus and kind of understand where they are in the broader picture of the university i have some where you know because of their their practice schedule and competition schedule, they're almost all online and they don't feel like they're a part of campus. So definitely in-person classes, I've seen a trend where students who have in-person are more likely to feel like they're part of campus than our students who are having to take more online. COVID has kind of obviously accelerated that a bunch. Um, in terms of what as a professor you can do, I think just being engaging with them and like you said just letting them know that you kind of understand where they're coming from um there is still obviously that expectation they are students first and we want them to you know get things in on time and be there as much as possible but just at least having that understanding in the back of your head of knowing like we're gonna push them as well but you know they're not going to be there every single day because they're going to be gone for a basketball game or they're going to be gone for a football game and just being able to kind of not be flexible but just understand where that is and you know that that is also a big part of why they're here as well they chose utah state obviously for the academic portion but obviously for their athletic portion as well i've had a lot of students that they'll tell me you know if it wasn't for tennis if it wasn't for softball i would become a nail technician I would you know just be working in my dad's company so you know it's engaging them and getting them to understand that they're a part of a bigger broader picture and that you know this degree is all going to help them as well yep not so much a question I guess but a comment so at universities or any organization, we all tend to work in silos in one way or another, right? And, you know, for students in my classes, the most important thing for me is them to learn what's being presented. Um, and it's nice to, to see your presentation today and see what you do on the academic side to provide support. It's nice to know that it's not just us, right? That there is good support. Um, but as far as breaking down barriers, it's nice to you know, between academics and athletics, it's nice to see barriers break come down when they can. Um, and ex for an example from my personal experiences, I, I got invited to come to the Whiteside Luncheon one year with one of the student athletes in my program. And it was, it wasn't so much about me coming to a lunch, but getting a, feeling appreciation from him for what had transpired in my classes and being that rewarded with, you know, you're my special guest and and that was, that was kind of neat to see, to experience. Um, I've been talking with Bobby Nash and, and Jerry Bovey about a game day professor program, got the name from Wonga, um, w with the same kind of thing, to try to kind of break down barriers and express gratitude to professors who, who I don't know, say, we don't necessarily have to go above and beyond, but do what we can, right, for student athletes. But it's nice for us on this side to see the hard work, dedication, commitment that's required to be a successful student athlete, which is something I don't think we necessarily have a very good appreciation of. They're just athletes, right? So not really a question, I guess, but a comment. But the more that we have opportunities to, to cross those boundaries, get out of our silos, I think it's good for us. I think it's good for the student athletes. It's good for Utah State University. Thank you. To um, Jeremiah, when you walked in, that we wanted to get with you because I know Justice and Jeremiah are talking. We, we were talking about doing a um, game day professor program appreciation. So I'll get with you after this and we can talk. 
about that idea you presented uh, way back when. Put a smile on my face when you were talking about it. I was like, oh, he understands. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank everyone for coming, and thank you guys for presenting. This is really great. Thank you. We have about 20, 25 people, and I'm really excited to actually have this on our ET website and hopefully get to send this to you because anyone who couldn't attend or anyone in the future who comes to Utah State to know what we do and what you guys do is really important. So be able to use that as a tool. So thank you guys very much. Thank you.